Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, May 25th, and this is the weekly market update. The disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this podcast or video is not to be taken as investment advice. I'm not a registered investment advisor. I cannot give you investment advice. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Okay, before we get started, just want to go over some of the actionable intelligence alert offerings that we have. Obviously, you know about the video and podcast because you're here. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, themes here that we are interested in or that we are invested in in the uh, actionable intelligence alert uh, model portfolio. Uh, we also have a free email that comes out once a week. In that, I usually post articles that I'm interested in or more, more in-depth information of what I've talked about on maybe one of the slides here. Uh, also, uh, links to podcasts or videos that I find interesting. Uh, it's just basically a little bit more information and uh, more um, four or five items a week, uh, but to give you more flavor of some of the things that I'm looking at and some of the things that uh, are are that I have found that I, that that are interesting to me, and I think are applicable to what we're talking about, and some of the um, themes that are undervalued and have upside. Again, after that, we do have a paid offering on Substack. Uh, the free email can be accessible in Substack. Please go into the show notes below. Uh, all of this is down there. Uh, we also have the. Um, actionable intelligence alert newsletter uh paid version in that we actually drill down into specific companies that we that i think have the potential to increase three to five percent or possibly ten or not percent three to five times we're looking for asymmetric opportunities something that can go up three five or ten times in a period of three to five years um we also I've instituted a dividend portfolio also separate uh, for those looking for income, but I'm in the dividend portfolio. I also focus on potential for capital gains. Also um, it's very easy. If you're interested in dividends, just to go buy an ETF of the dividend Kings or whatever, you know, companies that have raised their dividend every year for 20 or 50 years or whatever, that's perfectly all right. But what we're looking for in our dividend portfolio are companies that are undervalued or are out of favor, uh, but yet are paying high dividends and have the potential to see their business uh, inflect uh, and be valued higher. And so we're looking for a double whammy. So we also have that offering in there. The other thing that you have access to, if you're a paid subscriber to the actionable intelligence alert newsletter is our discord channel uh we have a lot of great guys on people on there i should say um and we share a lot of ideas there's a lot of people uh that are pretty sophisticated and uh they help uh keep everybody informed you get a lot of real time uh we have things on there like people we're tracking the different things around commodities and resources and companies in the portfolio. And before I even get a chance to post some of the updates, I mean, on a company, somebody else has already done it. People have come up with some really excellent ideas in there also uh, and share ideas. And so you get different perspectives. So that's, that, I think that's a valuable uh, uh, um, resource also. Some people find it uh, useful. So that's our offerings. Again, everything can be accessed in the show notes below. Uh, again, uh, you're welcome to take advantage of that as you see fit. Also, you know, we ask that you support the channel, uh, just, you know, liking the channel, uh, subscribing is great. I don't like begging for this stuff once in a while, I'll ask, but it does help the channel. Um, you know, this is a business we're running here. And so if you do like what we do here, if, it, if it's useful to you, um, there's different ways that you can support us. Obviously, just liking and subscribing um, in, in various other ways that uh, that are below in the show notes. So uh, we thank you for that and on to this week's info. So a uh, tweet here from Jesse Felder I thought was interesting. Uh, it says, as goes NVIDIA, so goes the S&P. It says here, the S&P 500's price to earnings ratio has risen more or less perfectly in line with changes in NVIDIA's share price in the 12 months since NVIDIA Day. And so... So goes NVIDIA, so goes the valuation of the entire U.S. stock market. 
uh, you know, again, NVIDIA is a great company. Things are great, but, you know, 50 times sales or 50 times earnings, 25 or 30 times sales. It's just, you know, it's a value proposition. Uh, and, you know, with a market cap of $2.5 trillion, I mean, is it going to double from here and be, you know, the U.S. economy is only like $25 trillion a year in GDP. So NVIDIA is 10% of the economy. I don't know. We've seen these bubbles before. Obviously, people don't agree with me. You either understand valuation or you don't. You understand bubbleicious conditions or you don't. You've seen this before or you haven't. And the younger you are and the less experienced you are, you haven't actually seen a bubble uh, sometimes. And so that's why I really advocate people to read the history of previous bubbles, because what you will see is, although the asset class that's in the bubble may change, uh, whether it was the nifty 50 stocks in the early 70s, whether it was internet stocks, whether it was real estate, whatever it is, whatever asset class is in a bubble, it always changed, but the thing changes. But the thing that doesn't change, the thing that stays consistent, if you study these, is the psychology around the bubble. Okay, the FOMO, the justifications of why the overvaluation uh, should, should exist, can continue to exist, and it never does. It's never different this time, guys. And so, yes, people have can can make all kinds of um, give all kinds of reasons uh, why these valuations are normal, why Nvidia is going to take over the world. We heard the same things about Cisco and other companies during the um, dot-com bubble. Again, I really, one of the key things I would say um, and one of the mantras I had, and I had to learn this the hard way. And so I know the demographic here is a lot of younger people um, and people are impatient, but you know, being patient and being decisive, as Charlie Munger said, is the key to success, okay? And understanding the psychology of these markets uh, understanding your own psychology, understanding your own biases. So it's a constant struggle. Uh, you know, it's almost, I, I'm almost to the point now where I've kind of thought that people that are successful investors are kind of the same as like somebody that's a great athlete. You're either kind of born with, I think, the basic tenets of it, uh, or you're not. Um, can you control emotion? Are you self introspective? Um, these type of things. So um, that doesn't mean that you can't be an active investor and have success, but uh, the less control you have over emotions, the less uh, willing you are to change your views when confronted with different information. Again, we all fight against this. We all are involved in this, but um, this is pretty obvious. This isn't going to continue forever. And eventually we're going to have a bear market. Eventually NVIDIA is going to reach the saturation point. It's not just going to continue to go up forever. Um, that doesn't mean it can't continue to go up, but it's by all standard valuations uh, based on the actual business. Again, this is another mistake that people make. They don't treat these things as businesses, okay? And so we, we've talked about that before. Is it overvalued uh, relative to what it can produce as returns for you? If it's just about the price going up or buying it at one price and selling it for a higher price, that's speculating, okay? And that's totally different than investing. So as long as you understand that distinction and you're comfortable with that kind of risk, then, you know, each, each to their own, to their own, to your own self be true. But I am telling you that as from an investment perspective, oh, I sell overvaluation and buy undervaluation. And I found that to be uh, a lot more successful through market cycles. You know, someone can say, you know, well, look at what's happened. You know, look at this chart here you know, since May 22 to here, and somebody's made a ton of money, and God bless you, I'll be with you. Uh, I'm glad for you, I'm happy for you. But you know, uh, to sit there and justify why it's going to go higher. I mean, I don't think the business itself uh, justifies the valuation. So just to comment on that. And so you know, the, the company sales, uh, revenue, I mean, it's taken off, right? I mean, this is where chat GPT launched. This is kind of what's been fueling it, the whole AI uh, bubble, uh, I wouldn't say bubble, but uh, what's happened. And so, you know, it, it, this gets harder, these numbers get harder and harder to uh, exceed, right? And the thing about it is, you know, NVIDIA is on top of the world, but excessive profits or excessive success 
draws competition. Uh, so I would just say that, you know, again, I get chastised all the time. But it was the same thing talking about Tesla and these other things. There's people that just believe and they're not going to be dissuaded. So, uh, yes, the sales have, you know, I mean, in basically less than two years have went up by a factor of five. Uh, that's why the price is higher. So, uh, but uh, is it sustainable? I'm not sure it is. So I want to talk about gold. You know, a lot of the resource sector got hit this last couple of weeks. Um, oil, gold, copper, a lot of these things were overbought. I mean, you're going to have these short-term uh, trading mach machinations. I don't really like to comment on short-term things. I mean, things were overbought, uh, especially gold and copper. You can see here that uh, this is a relative strength index, RSI. Uh, you can see the overbought conditions in gold. I mean, these things are going to go in spurts, right? Then consolidate, then move higher, then consolidate. I think we're in a secular bull market for resources. I've said it before, gold's included in that. You're not going to have a commodity bull market, not have gold participate. You know, we've talked about all the conditions, Um of of why gold's going to go higher um and uh we're going to talk about that some more coming up here but uh i wouldn't you know what i would do is look to accumulate on um pullbacks you're in a bull market it's not kind of the same thing we've always said like in uranium you know and so uh i think what you if you fully understand the conditions that are powering this gold bull market and the fact that they're likely to continue i think that you know gold is really undervalued or relative to a lot of other asset classes and we'll get into that so increment increment entum increment entum this is the uh, people that put out the in gold we trust uh report that came out, I think last week, I've been going through it. So I'm going to use a lot of their charts uh, and some of their uh, editorial content. Uh, credit goes to them. They put this out for free. They have a, I'll put a link in the show notes to this. They have, it's like the in gold we trust report is what it's called. Uh, it's been put out for years, I think almost 15 years now, something like that. It's free. The overall deck is like 460 slides. They have a more condensed uh, deck, uh, but it gets into, I mean, if you're interested in gold, it's worth going out, spending some time over a couple couple days, spending some time inside of it and, and taking a look. I mean, it's just a wealth of information and it's free. Um, I always look forward to it every year and I find it extremely useful. Um, here is a chart from the chart book uh you know i don't i'm not an expert on technical analysis i try to use fundamental analysis but i do like to use technical uh, analysis to try to find when something's inflecting uh based on fundamentals because uh, i've tried to incorporate that more into into my investing why because a lot of times when we find a distressed asset or an asset that's facing a business inflection that's been ignored. It's usually bombed out and just, you know, it looks like an EKG of somebody that had a, a heart attack. It's just flatlined. And so sitting there waiting for two, three years for the market to recognize it sometimes is dead capital, right? And so one of the things I like to try to start incorporating is looking for breakouts or looking for when the market recognizes the, um, uh, uh, what, whatever the theme is that I, that I think is undervalued when everybody else begins to recognize and you see the money coming in, technical analysis can help with that. I mean, obviously to get the maximum gains, you want to buy things when things are extremely overvalued, undervalued um, and are left for dead. But again, I think if you can recognize when something's breaking out using technical analysis or what are recognized high probability events in technical analysis, like this, cup and handle formation that's multi-year um, then you can really step on the accelerator and be decisive you know you have been patient as charlie munger says and then uh when the patience is rewarded and you understand and your thesis is then beginning to spread out and bear fruit then to really stomp on the accelerator 
and be decisive. And I think that's what we've seen in gold. You know, this is a classic, what they call a cup and handle formation. You can see the cup here developing over many years. You can see the overall bull market in gold uh, uh, over the last 24 years. Um, but this kind of consolidation in this cup, and then you have the handle, right? So it's like a coffee cup. This is your cup, this is your handle. And then typically why this is decisive and recognizable is once you break out of this handle, uh, this is typically indicates a very, I mean, it's a decisive move above the handle. This is typically recognized as a very powerful um, uh, indicator of further upside. So uh, guarantees, of course, in anything, we, we, we know that. But we play probabilities here. And if you want to go back and investigate, you know, cup and handles and go back and look at technical analysis and probabilities and what what classic cup and handles. And this is not like over a couple of days or a month or short term trading. This is developed over many years. I think this is a secular generational breakout. And I think that we're going to see substantially higher gold prices for many of the reasons we've already talked about and will continue to talk about. Um, monetary and fiscal malfeasance by Western governments. They're in too much debt. There's only one way out. We've talked about it before, and that's inflating the currency. That's positive for gold. Uh, geopolitical, um, we're, you know, basically, I, I don't say this to be provocative. I know some people have accused me of being provocative, but this um, multipolar world that's developing, this World War III that's being fought asymmetrically, uh, not necessarily uh, with major actors like in World War II or World War I, but uh, economically, politically, through proxies, things like that. Um, that's going to further, uh, you know, we've seen, you know, we've got two wars going on, one in, in the Middle East, one in Eastern Europe. You know, we had an attempted assassination of a European leader, something that hasn't happened in two decades uh, or more uh, with the recent attempted assassination of the Slovak president, Robert Fico, who, by the way, uh, was advocating for what? Uh, less uh, war uh, and, and refusing to send weapons to Ukraine. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. But what I'm trying to say is we're seeing a lot of things. We're seeing a lot of instability. This is also for, good for gold, right? Um, we're going. We're going to have, I think, baked in inflation, which... I think is going to uh, change people's views away from financial assets. You know, the last 40 years, we've had declining interest rates. Now we're going to see rising rates. Why? Because the fiscal deficits are so high that the governments are going to be forced to have to pay higher interest rates to attract capital because people are starting to wonder if they're going to be paid back or what the currency's value that they're going to be paid back. I mean, who in their right mind would buy a 10 or 30 year bond and hold it of, of, of any Western government, you'd have to be out of your mind. Are they tradable? Yes. Uh, are they places to park capital in the short term? Yes. Uh, but are they, I mean, would you really buy and hold a 10-year U.S. Treasury bond based on what you see? I mean, if you look at the internal politics of the West, uh, you see what's happening. Populism's on the rise. Nationalism's on the rise. People are fed up with the old order. And so that's not, I think that's positive for gold. So you have a lot of things that we've been talking about that, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people uh, don't grasp these things or aren't aware of them or aren't processing them. I mean, there are, you know, there are people in, that are midwits. They just are not able to do second and third level um, thinking. And there are people that are just, you know, die hard uh, tied to the old order that are not going to give it up. So uh, these, this is the, this is, you know, several of the reasons why I think going forward, we're in a secular, probably multi-decade bull market in gold. I mean, uh, you can't forecast the future with any certainty, but I mean, all the conditions are there, right, uh, for uh, gold to move higher. Not in, Notwithstanding the fact that the BRICS countries, the global South and East, are decoupling from U.S. treasuries because they don't simply trust the U.S. government. Uh, the U.S. government's uh, off the reservation, acting as a rogue actor, pulling out all the stops and not doing things diplomatically, but just trying to use force uh, and using the U.S. dollar and using uh, its ability to control uh, the World Bank, SWIFT, all these things. But its grasp is declining, and we'll get into that. And I think that's a major reason also. I mean, who 
if you're in the global south or east and you're opposed to the U.S. hegemon because you have your own interests, you know, every country has its own interests. And the, for the people that are in those countries, though, their interests are just as valid as the people in the U.S. And so in, in the U.S., in, the, in this arrogance that we have that, you know, our way is the best way and everybody needs to kowtow. I mean, that's just put yourself in the shoes of other people. I mean, this is one of the things that I was taught when I was uh, in the bargaining unit and I was in a leadership position. You know, when you're negotiating with other parties and you're trying to get an outcome that's most advantageous for your for your side, you have to put yourself in the other person's shoes and understand, try to understand at least where they're coming from or what their interests are. And we just don't do that. We just say our way or the highway. And, you know, I think a major turning point that's going to be looked at as historians is this unprecedented confiscation of assets and bullying uh, by the U.S. It's just been unprecedented. So everybody's like, OK, well, the U.S. cannot be trusted. It's a, it's it's if they don't if you don't like what you do or something, like that, they just confiscate your 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 assets. And that's why you're seeing a decoupling. And I think gold is going to be a major beneficiary of that. So this explains a lot here, right? This is share of global GDP, the G7, this is your Western hegemon in the BRICS, 1992 to 2029 estimated. You see over time, this is what I've been saying, the emerging markets are on the rise. The old order is in decline. I mean, it intersected right here in 2021. I mean, and you see more and more countries are going to be joining the BRICS because it's to their advantage. This is, do you want to be part of what's, the new order or part of the old order. And this is exactly, I think this chart explains of quite a bit of what's going on geopolitically. This and why I think this is going to be uh, one of the main things that uh, we need to keep an eye on. This, this trend is going to continue. The global South and East is on the march. It's on the rise economically. And along with economic strength and economic growth comes political strength and growth, right? And wanting to participate. If you're some of the largest economies in the world, you're not going to want to be dictated. Your interests, you then have the clout and you, you want your interests understood and respected. And so you have to negotiate with these people. You can't just dictate to them anymore. And I think that's another reason why this is going to be beneficial for gold going forward. So this is part of the editorial uh, from the In Gold We Trust for 2024, the uniqueness of gold. I thought this was very, very uh, important to say because I've been saying this for a while and I think they've put it a lot more articulately than John can. But uh, I think you'll get the gist that this is what we've been talking about. It said the freezing of Russian currency reserves impressively demonstrated to the world that debt Debt based currency reserves are ultimately just a promise and can be converted into worthless database entries in a moment in the event of a conflict. The uniqueness of gold, a neutral reserve currency without counterparty risk, is now being rediscovered. The structural increase in central bank demand is a key piece of the new playbook, mainly because central bank demand is relatively less price sensitive. One could say that central banks have put a floor under the gold price. And so, you know, central banks don't buy gold to make a profit. They buy gold as a reserve asset for the, you know, as a reserve. A lot of times back in the old order, they would use the U.S. dollar or treasuries or things like that. But again, uh, this unprecedented um, decision that was made, uh, I think, changes changes everything. And I thought this was uh, very well said uh about why gold, I think, going forward is going to have that floor under it. They don't care about the price. They care more about the stability and their reserves. And so that doesn't mean they're just going to just buy gold with with abandon. Uh, do I, but I do think if the price drops, you'll see central banks continue to buy. And we've seen now for the last two going on three years, record central bank buying. I mean, this is happening in real time. And a lot of people are just missing it. And so this goes back to what I've been saying all along. I mean, you have to take this into consideration. If you don't, you're not going to get it. You're not getting the big picture. People say, well, don't talk about politics. It has to, just stick to stocks. This is, this is the game, guys. This is the 
ultimate thing that's going to, I think, uh, have a ripple effect on everything else that's happening. It's not the main thing we need to consider, but it's one of the main things we need to consider. This is going to reach into every facet of economics and what is investable, what's uninvestable, what's going to be, uh, what has upside and what doesn't. And so this is from Zygmunt Brzezinski's book, 1997, The Great Chessboard. Okay, this is a quote. And if you, when you see this quote from 1997, now you know what the Anglo-American uh, hegemon, what, why the things are happening the way they're happening. And this is a quote from the book. Now, this Zygmunt Brzezinski was uh, during, started out, I think, during the Carter administration. He was a, you know, foreign policy advisor. He's one of the deep state thinkers uh, that set the tone for the neocons. And so this is the direct quote from the book, The Grand Chessboard or what used to be called in the 19th century, the great game. Potentially the most dangerous scenario would be a grand coalition of China, Russia, and perhaps Iran in an anti-hegemonic coalition united not by ideology, but by complementary grievances would be, would be reminiscent in scale and scope of the challenge once posed by the Sino-Soviet bloc, though this time China would likely be the leader and Russia the follower. This was written in 1997, guys. This is exactly playing out. And this is what this all this is about. It has nothing to do with democracy. It has nothing to do with, with rules-based order. It has to do with maintaining the Anglo-American hegemon. He says it right here, anti-hegemonic coalition. Okay? Yeah, because they have interests that aren't necessarily aligned with the U.S.'s. These countries aren't allowed to have interests. These countries aren't allowed. They're supposed to subjugate they're, what they're trying to do for their populations to what the Anglo-American initiatives are or priorities are, it's not going to happen like that. And so there's going to be conflict. Now, I wish there wasn't. There's ways, I believe, to, to negotiate, to come to win-win solutions. But if the U.S. chooses to go down this path, uh, is it really – is it, it and its vassals really going to be uh, – are they in a position to really do that when all these other countries are on the upswing? I don't see it. But – this is something that needs to be taken into consideration in your thinking going forward. And so you see it, foreign central banks dumping U.S. treasuries, replacing with gold. So it's it's been happening for a while, okay? Here's your U.S. debt held by foreign central banks going down, right, from a high of 65% down to 45%. It's The trend is in view. And what's been on the upswing? central bank gold holdings are on the upswing. And so they're never going to be, you know, are we going to get back to this level here on central bank gold holdings? I don't know. Uh, likely not. But um, I mean, this is this side's the actual uh, central bank gold holdings. So at one point, you were up to 70% in the early 80s. And then so, but can this get to 30, 40%? Why not? And so that's the opportunity. That's why this is another reason, you know, and this all ties back to what we just were talking about. And so this has been underway for a while. It's going to continue. And that's why I think there's a solid put under the gold price, right? And so here's show this chart before, but I want to re-emphasize re this. The investment community of advisors and things like that are totally out to lunch on what's happening with gold. OK, this is the gold allocation of investment advisors for 2023. And so 71 percent of advisors are telling their people advising zero or less than one percent gold holdings. Uh, you know, 27 percent have a one to five percent or less uh, allocation to gold. And, you know, so basically no one owns gold in the West. Right. Or in the U.S., um, their advisors are not telling them. So eventually this will shift and that will probably be, you know, well after the fact when gold has moved substantially higher and people have just said, hey, you know, it's difficult for people that were raised under a certain regime of low interest rates, the U.S. hegemon, all of these things to all of a sudden just shift their thinking. But you have to be flexible. You have to look at things for the way they are, not the way they were. OK, and that's just not how the investment 
um, community looks at things. Okay. Uh, they're always going to be what's working, right? Is, is, you know, it's, you're really going out on a limb if you go and tell, you know, well, we need to get rid of these. We need to lower the allocation of U.S. Treasuries and you need to be buying gold and, and, and telling somebody that in Edwards Jones office. I mean, that's just not going to be something that you're going to see anytime soon. I think it eventually will get there because it'll be obvious at that point and people will be clamoring for that. But this is another reason uh, why I think gold we're just at the beginning of this moves, right? So um, I think this is an important thing to understand. Uh, you know, central banks are the ones that are pushing the gold price higher from their buying. We've explained why, but individual investors, retail investors, advisors that advise people, they, they just don't haven't got the memo yet. All right, shifting to this uh, again, you know, um, Texas, America's renewable energy king. You see here, this is from Financial Times. After trailing for years, Texas has become America's clean energy giant. You see what's happening. Um, I mean, I don't have any comment. I just wanted to point this out. I mean, this is going gangbusters here in Texas. I can tell you right now, just on some of the work that I do, uh, it's like... A tremendous runway of of potential. I would be I would prefer if people were building nuclear power plants and gas combined cycle gas plants, but um, it's just a tremendous opportunity. I think just around the Houston area, I know of about at least a half dozen or more solar farms that are being built. Uh, it's an excellent opportunity if you're in the construction or project management because there's not enough people uh and the people i'm running into don't know what they're doing basically i mean it's kind of almost laughable there's there's hundreds of millions billions of dollars being thrown at this and there's just you know i use the analogy that i've tried to explain to people if we double the amount of teams in the nfl next year from 30 to 60 i believe there's 30 teams in the nfl if we doubled it to 60 what would the quality of play in the nfl would be well it would be tremendously less because there's just not enough skilled players for that high level same thing in the Premier League or any professional sports league. If you double the amount of teams or triple the amount of teams, and that's basically what's happened in this market because of the um, this net zero push, because of the Inflation Reduction Act, the way it's set up where it has no caps. It's a gold rush mentality. And so m money's being thrown at these things. And uh, it's just kind of funny to watch just the chaos, the a lot of waste a lot of uh people that have no business being anywhere near this basically if you can fog a mirror you can get an entry-level job you can get management jobs i mean there's just not enough people and i'm running into it every day frustration that i have just around talent around project management and electrical safety and good operations practice it just doesn't exist because you don't have the experience you just don't have enough people, but you have an unlimited amount of money coming at this thing. So uh, make hay while the sun shines, I say. And, uh, you know, if you are in project management or construction management, uh, I mean, you can easily get a six figure job without even trying. And um, so just wanted to point that out. I don't know what this means long term. Uh, so far, our prices in Texas are for electricity haven't really been climbing like in other states that have went nuts with uh, renewables. But, um, you know, well, I'm not going to go down that again, Brody. So far, it doesn't seem to have affected us as much as other states that have this emphasis. I just think we have such a large economy and so diversified. Uh, we do have a lot of uh, industry here, uh, especially in petrochemical, and there's a lot of cogeneration there that I think is really, you know, holding up the... Uh, uh, a, a lot of the um, base load. So our friend Javier Malay uh, was in Spain this week, I guess. And uh, there was part of a, um, we have European um, parliament elections coming up next month. I think the first week of June. Um, and a lot of the Vox party in Spain sponsored this coalition of populist parties to come and have a conference. Malay was invited from Argentina and I really like this guy. I mean, I don't know. I'm not exactly sure about this guy's motives, but I, I can't help but liking him because he says stuff that is really poking in the eye of the establishment and of the globalists. Um, but then he does some things that I think are 
pro-globalist, but I won't get into that. Basically, this was in Reuters, said Spain recalls ambassador after Argentina's Malay calls PM, prime minister's wife corrupt. Now, I think the prime minister of um, uh, Spain, Pedro Sanchez, is a socialist. Um, and I don't know this anything about this guy. So if anybody's a Spanish listener or reader of my work, maybe you can comment on this. I'm not exactly sure. But I just think it's funny some of the stuff that he says. Uh, he holds no, you know, I'm not going to repeat some of the things he said. You can look up his interviews, but he has no tolerance for any status at all, um, at least verbally. And so here's here's some snippets from the article. It said Spain recalled its ambassador to Buenos Aires for consultations on Sunday after Argentina's president Javier Malay made derogatory comments about Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez's wife during a far right rally in Madrid. Malay's had called Sanchez's wife, Bogana Gomez, quote, corrupt during a rally in Madrid organized by the far-right Vox Party and attended by many of its international allies. Other ministers also condemned Malay's speech in which he described socialism as, quote, cursed and carcinogenic, unquote. Sanchez leads Spain's Socialist Party. So he said even more stronger words about socialists and status. Uh, I just get a kick out of this guy. Um, he kind of says stuff that a lot of people think, but don't say again. But this is another example. I think would we'll, be interesting to see what happens in the European Parliament parliamentary elections. I don't think you're going to have some earth shattering event that's going to reverse things, but I think you're going to see gains by the far right populist parties. Um, people, I think, have had enough of the unfettered in immigration. You can see, watch the videos. There's uh, there's X accounts that show. I mean, uh, I thought the other day there was one video. I think the guy that's the account is Radio Genoa. Anyways, he constantly shows this stuff. Uh, and it showed this Portuguese young lady looking out the window of a cafe, just had her arms like propped up on the windowsill. And everybody was, this was in a city in Portugal and everybody that was walking by and it said, this young girl is wondering where all the Portuguese are because it was all foreigners, it was all immigrants to Portugal. Um, and you know, my interview on immigration, I think it should be stopped. Uh, there's a reason why they're doing it. It's to replace the native populations so they can have this, uh, you know, peasant, uh, uneducated peasant class that can be easily controlled and they can, you know, get rid of the native populations and dilute them so that they can control. This is part of the globalist, you know, one world order, new world order and all that nonsense. So um, we'll see what happens. I think uh, it may be too late for some of the countries. You saw, you know, people wanted to argue, but it was amazing watching in um, the UK recent elections they had where a lot of the cities elected, um, you know, Muslim uh foreigners as basically the mayors of these cities uh, i saw i think it was the mayor of leeds or one of them he was a pakistani he was giving his you know ex not acceptance speech but whatever victory speech in you know whatever whatever language they speak in pakistan and uh this is the uk so i think that uh one of two things is i think one of two things is going to happen either these people are just going to be the native populations are just going to they may be so beat down and afraid to do anything that they just basically accept the, what's going to happen, or there's going to be a tremendous amount of pushback. And to fix this now is going to require uh, beyond just a you know punch in the nose. It's it's in order to fix this the way it needs to be fixed. It, I don't even want to get into. It's going to be very ugly. Uh, otherwise, what more than likely will happen is the native population will just be subjugated and overwhelmed uh, over time. And so we'll see, but uh, I don't hold out a lot of hope for a lot of these countries. So Javier Blas is somebody else that we follow on X. Uh, and he gives like, uh, you know, we've talked up copper, copper crested $5 a pound. But he brings some uh, another view to it to take into consideration. And I think it's worth looking at everything and not just assuming that, you know, everything's roses in a linear line from the lower left to the upper right. 
And so here's what he says. The, o the Uber bull argument looks beyond present demand weakness into a future when, by the rosiest estimates, refined copper consumption doubles from about 25 million tons now to 50 million tons by 2035. The gap between ballooning demand and struggling supply implies the energy transition would be short-circuited, consultancy S&P Global said in its Future of Copper report, often cited by the bulls as proof of their argument. Yet those demand projections aren't forecasts, but instead scenarios built backwards. Assume the world fully meets its net zero by 2050 commitments, and then estimate how much copper would be needed to make that happen. The problem is the globe isn't moving toward net zero by 2050, not even close. Now look who's using those scenarios. As propaganda, the mining industry. Our friend Robert Friedland never stops talking about this. I'm just pointing that out as that's not part of this, his comment. That's what I said. That should tell you a lot about their usability. So again, um, I think you know EV demand, we saw that happen with EVs. That's kind of petering out. This net zero thing's not going to happen. But don't forget and don't, there's still supply issues, right? They're still under investment. Um, yes, I don't think that this uh, energy transition is going to happen. It's ridiculous. It's, there's no way it's going to happen. Um, it's going to peter out. This thing is already crested. ESG, we've already, we're already over the uh, hump on peak ESG. Uh, you're going to see pushback. It's going to die on the vine because it's not, it's stupid and it's against the laws of physics. In order to really have what they want to do, you need a basically tyrannical totalitarian government that can do whatever it wants. And I don't see that happening. So uh, they'll try, but I don't see it happening. There will be, you know, uh, pushback. Uh, you know, they're talking about getting rid of beef. Cause, I mean, this is, just, it's just, the, uh, once it becomes reality sets in, it's like people are going to be like, no, we're not doing this. This is dumb. Um, but this is, this makes sense. Uh now, yes, the mining street energy is pumping this because people talk their own book. This is nothing new, right? Um, you know, you don't ask a barber if you need a haircut, you know? Um, so, you know, you don't you don't ask a realtor if it's time to buy a new house, uh, buy, you know, buy a house because it's always, you know, good to buy a house, right? If you ask a realtor because they get a commission. So incentives matter. But I do, I do think that the net zero thing, we're not going to have to double consumption, but consumption is going to grow just because of the global south and east that new fertile crescent that emerging markets and just the uh what's required as wealth increases copper demand uh does grow and so uh here's another slide where he goes on it says the super bullish consumption case largely sidesteps other problems with copper prices above ten thousand dollars a ton the incentive to switch increases. Copper is the best affordable electricity conductor, but aluminum, which costs about $2,600 a ton, can replace it and is already in some applications. As prices rise, engineers would have a strong incentive to use copper more sparingly. That is true to a certain extent, and electrical engineers can that are listening can comment. Uh, I'm not necessarily sure that you can wind a, you know, high voltage transformer with copper wind or uh, aluminum windings. There's a heat, you know, one of the things that attacks electrical circuits and degrades them is heat. And I think copper uh, is one of the things that uh, minerals, why we use copper, as long as it's affordable, is because of its ability to uh, handle the uh, current and the heat that's generated from that. Uh, and so somebody else would have to comment on that. Uh, but I do think that, you know, there has been under under supply. Now, if the price goes up, you know, this is what you would expect, supply and demand. This is he's just talking about supply and demand here. Right. As the price of something goes up, substitution comes in, uh, recycling comes in or crackhead stealing copper, whatever, call it that uh, uh, new new substitution, uh, increased mining of lower grade deposits. But all this stuff takes time, right? And so uh, if you're in China or India or Malay or uh, Indonesia or the Philippines or Bangladesh, are you not going to build that substation to build out your uh, electrical grid for the population because you're waiting the copper price is too high? You probably just pay the money. 
Uh, but I do think uh, he is right that uh, uh, these things will come into play. This is basic supply and demand. And that's why you really have to watch these things. That's why the resource markets are not buy and hold and forget. Okay. They have, uh, again, mining is a terrible business. It's a probably most of the time capital net negative returns. Okay. But there are times when you get into these types of situations where the price gets to a sufficient level and lower cost producers or producers that have existing assets can make hay for some uh, media, short to medium time frame, right? A year, 18 months, two years where they can make super normal profits. And so I think we're, you know, we are in a secular, uh, I don't see a lot of new mines coming online. All these things will happen at a sufficient higher price. Uh, capital will uh, solve these problems if it's allowed to. But uh, uh, I, do, I don't think that just extrapolating linearly in working backwards and saying, well, net zero by 2050 will require 50 million tons per year of copper. Uh, yeah, that probably works on a spreadsheet, but is it going to happen in real life? No. I do think it's bullish for fossil fuels because we're not going to replace the fossil fuels like people thought. Do I think it's bullish for nuclear? So all of these things kind of tie together if you think about them, right? And I think you have to take a nuanced view and a uh, unbiased view. And that's why I wanted to show these slides because uh, he is correct. So we've talked about World War III. We talked about last week the tariffs that the Biden administration put on China. And so obviously there's re retaliation, right? Um, that's part of, you know, people say, well, that doesn't mean World War III, John. No, but this is part of it, right? The proxy wars, the economic warfare, the tariffs. This is going to be, is this disinflationary or inflationary? So you're getting my point. I mean, that's how I'm looking at these things. So this is exactly what we expected would happen. And this will continue. It says China retaliates to U.S. tariffs. China hits back at U.S. and EU as trade rows deepen. China has launched an anti-dumping probe into imports of widely used plastic from the U.S., EU, Taiwan, and Japan. The announcement from the Ministry of Commerce that it will investigate imports of polyoxymethylene copolymer, which is used in electronics and cars, is a signal that China will hit back in its trade disputes with the U.S. and Europe. Uh, expect more of this, not less of it. So we show this, a lot of people want to make comments. I just show it for information purposes, just GMOs, forward return expectations. Every month they put them out. But you will note that, you know, again, because of the overvaluation in the U.S. stock market, the forward returns are projected to be negative. We're still positive because of the undervaluation in emerging markets. Um, that seems to be where the uh, opportunity is. And in emerging market debt. So uh, take it for what it is. It's not the... It's just one more data point, but I, I, I happen to be uh, agree in agreement with this. So I wanted to point this out. I thought this was interesting. Um, of course, on the left, you will see the uh, 2005 rec uh, record water temperature anomalies in the Caribbean and in the South Atlantic or Mid-Atlantic, whatever, however this is determined, South Atlantic. Um, this is where a lot of the hurricanes, tropical storms develop. And 2005 was actually the year that you had Hurricane Katrina. And so you see the record water temperature anomalies, May 14th to 20th. Um, and then you look to the right, and these are the record water temperature anomalies for now. And you can see the difference. We have record warm water. This is a breeding ground. This is going to be... Uh, potentially a very, very active hurricane season. As a matter of fact, they think it's going to be two to three times the, the average. And so uh, I think that people should take this into consideration. Now, of course, all the global warming people are going to come out if we have a lot of active hurricane season. See, we were right, blah, 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 blah. But, uh, you know, I don't have time or the inclination to go back and look at the history of water temperatures uh, and correlate that with hurricanes. What I will say is that this is something to be aware of and for our purposes if we have several hurricanes or tropical storms that come through the gulf of mexico there's a tremendous amount of oil and gas production in the gulf that will be shut down 
for periods of time. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that not only could we have destructive storms, okay, uh, and a lot more of them and a lot more tropical storms, this could really, uh, you know, going into the election, if we have to take off Gulf of Mexico production, remember, uh, prices for commodities are done at the margin. So if you're having to close down and restart, close down and restart uh, throughout the summer and heading into the election, which is only about 150 days away, and oil that forces oil prices up to you know, 90, a hundred dollars a barrel and gasoline is 450 a gallon on election day or $5 in some places. Um, you know, uh, that's not going to bode well for Mr. Biden's reelection, notwithstanding the fact that I live at the very tip of Texas. Uh, and I'm hopeful that we don't have any hurricanes because I'm only about 20 miles inland from the, uh, Gulf of Mexico. So, uh, Something to watch. Hurricane season kicks off June 1st. It's next week. And uh, it really doesn't become more active really until like August or September. But uh, even if you get tropical storms and a lot of times even down here in the Bay of Campeche, something can pop up, you know, in a day or two and be in Texas in two or three days. And again, if you get some major hurricanes coming up through here and they have to shut down all this production and evacuate, you know, you have to shut down the the production rigs then come after the storm come back out if nothing's damaged put it back online up and down up and down it could affect like i said at the margin uh oil and gas prices so uh something to watch something to keep in mind obviously this is going to be you know for everybody uh the um climate change zealots this will be food you know for them this will be like steroids for them see we told you blah 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 but uh I think that, uh, you know, better to understand what's happening. I mean, <laughs> this is this is like, you know, this is hot water, warm water is what, you know, once these storms get going, they, that's what fuels them. So all these people that are in Puerto Rico and stuff and Cuba and the Dominican Republic, uh, they're probably, you know, maybe I would uh, get off the islands for the, this hurricane season if I could. But we'll see. Uh, I just wanted to point this out. I thought this struck me as very, very interesting. This is, again, the main development region, and compared to 2005 when we had Katrina, you could see, I mean, we're going to have, uh, and I think this will make it more into the news as the hurricane season comes up and people figure out what's going on. Again, we want to be ahead of the curve. Uh, we think that this is, uh, I have to watch this anyways for projects I have going on along the Gulf Coast and prepare accordingly for the uh, hurricane season, which, like I said, kicks off June 1st. Uh, Trader Ferg, I thought this was a, a good, uh, you know, tweet he's made before. He he reposted it. Um, I put here, time is precious. Spend it on things that matter. People will obsess over sports teams when they could be doing the same with sectors and companies, which will directly affect their future. Obsess over things that have the ability to improve the quality of your life. I could not say that better. Uh, in retrospect, I wish that I would have spent more time on things that were more important. But again, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The next best time is today. So, you know, as long as you're on earth, um, you know, you can always be making forward progress and trying to improve. And I think if you're in your 20s and you're just starting out, if you can absorb a lot of these life lessons from other people and apply them, uh, I think you'll have a better, you know, instead of just learning everything the hard way, you know, it's, it's easier to learn life lessons. But again, I think experience sometimes has to be a teacher because some of these things are like abstract concepts. And until you really, really feel it yourself uh, or experience yourself, sometimes it doesn't, it's not as easy grasped. But uh, anyway, I thought this was an excellent, he, he's tweeted this before, but I just wanted to reiterate this. I think it uh, uh, makes perfect sense. Okay, I am now going to enter the realm of political commentary. Many people will not like what I'm about to show. One of the slides is very, very for mature audiences only. I mean, the discussion. So if you have children listening, the last slide is about some uh, things that happened in Germany this week. I was hesitant to put it on, but I think it makes sense. Again, this is the political section. Some people like this. Some people don't. I always put it at the end and give this warning. If you don't like my political commentary 
or my views, this would be the time to leave. I wish you well. Uh, we can agree to disagree. Having said that, let's move on. So this was a tweet uh, by Zero Hedge this week. Um, I put up here Bilbo Baggins' comments on the so-called strength of the U.S. economy. Obviously, I nicknamed Janet Yellen as Bilbo Baggins. Uh, here's what she said. America's strong economic performance under POTUS's leadership continues to serve as a key engine for, resili for a resilient global economy. As my G7 counterparts and I gather, we must work together to bolster the global economy and promote sustainable growth. And so Zero Hedge chimed in. And by strong economic performance, you mean one trillion in debt every hundred days? Yeah, if you can spend a hundred a, a trillion dollars every hundred days, you can keep you know this weekend at Bernie's economy moving forward. Uh, we've talked about that before. So uh, people have different views on it. I think that you know one way or another, you can't just spend a trillion dollars uh, every hundred days that you don't have. And at some point, you know, uh, we had this in discussion kind of in the discord this week, you know, these debts, you know, being $35 trillion in national debt, the unfunded liabilities being in the hundreds of trillions of dollars. And people are like, well, so what? We've been in debt forever. It's been growing forever. And, you know, one of the things I think that people need to understand about these things is they don't really matter until they matter. And then that's all that matters, right? So uh, that's what I would suggest is that um, you can't focus your entire life or investment career on some low probability event of a crash or some kind of change in the monetary system or banking crisis. But you need to be aware that you always have that you're sitting on a powder keg or you have that sort of Damocles over you and that this will continue until it can't continue anymore. And that you can look at the historical nature of other countries or empires that have went down this same path that we're on and how it ended up. Uh, the empire will fall. The currency will be destroyed. There'll be a lot of displacement and uh, reckoning. Does that happen next week? Does it happen in 10 years? Does it happen in 50 years? Unknowable. But you need to understand that Bilbo Baggins is a liar. Uh, Bilbo Baggins doesn't represent you she represents a global hegemon that's trying to desperately hold on to power and influence. So here's another one from Geiger Capital. Once again, there is no student debt forgiveness or canceling. It's Well, let me just read the Associated Press tweet first. Biden cancels student loans for another 160,000 borrowers, even as the plan faces legal challenges from Republican states. So Geiger Capital says, once again, there is no student debt forgiveness or canceling. It's simply a transfer of debt onto taxpayers who have no loans or who have already paid theirs back. It is debt reassignment based on politics. It's a politician buying votes at expenses of other people. Well, yeah, it's kind of a Captain Obvious thing. Uh, it's an election year. So they're going to pull out all the stops. This is what all politicians do, right? They give sops to people to get votes because um, like, you know, what else are they going to do? These politicians, this Biden is mentally defective. He's got Alzheimer's disease or some type of other mental his mental faculties. I mean, he's a career politician. OK, they're they're liars. That's what they are. They lie and they spend your money on things uh, to buy votes. And that's the system. Uh, and if you give money to them or if you're in a politically favored by them, then you'll benefit. It will be the same thing. If, uh, you know, Mr. Trump gets in there and you get a, a full Republican Congress and Senate, who's going to benefit the people that normally benefit the, you know, people, members of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the defense industry, uh, things of this nature. So it, it doesn't it's two sides of the same coin. And yes, we can ag all agree that this is bull crap and we don't want it to um, continue. But what are you going to do? That's why I always say vote harder. How's that working out for you? My view is to withdraw support from this system as much as you can, okay? I'm not saying become a monastic and live a, but, you know, why are you engaging in sports ball? Why do you still have that cable package that's $140 a month? Why are you consuming their media? Why are you consuming their, their sick care products? Why are you uh, doing all these things that they want you to do that supports their system? If you withdraw your support, okay, and you don't have to... I, I've done it as much as I can. Okay. Yes. You're, you're forced to interact at some point, 
But if you, uh, again, go back to what's important and withdraw your support from things that are unimportant, that you really don't need, that don't benefit your life, and, and we start, that grows over time, which I believe it will, uh, then you withdraw from the system. You've done your part, okay? That's what they care about, okay? If you If everybody tomorrow stopped supporting sports ball and stopped and, and canceled their cable subscriptions and satellite and stopped consuming their media, this thing would change immediately. Okay. Because that's what they care about. Ultimately, this is always all the time about money. It's what it always ends up about money, 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 avarice. Okay. The, the love of money. That's what this comes down to for these people. They want money. They want an easy life. I mean, they're sociopaths people. And pe that's hard for people to accept because now you are you realize what you're dealing with and you don't have any power over it. The only power you have is how you spend your money. You can choose who to give your money to. Okay, so this is the next thing. If there's any children, maybe you should ask them to leave the room. So I thought this was sickening. Um, I put here as the caption of the slide, you were warned we would end up here. Two steps forward, one step back. That's progressivism, constantly advancing. And so basically what happens is, is that it's not that there's no penalties in Germany for child porn. They've lowered the penalties, okay? They're not just going to approve child pornography and child exploitation. It's always going to be two steps forward, one step back, okay? And continually advancing. And so um, they didn't get rid of penalties. That was what some people said on Twitter. Um, Newsweek felt it necessary to come in and do a fact check on this. Why? I don't even like talking about it. this is so distasteful and sickening. I don't even like talking about it. But this is what's happening in the world. And this goes back all the way to the Canaanites. People don't want to talk about this. Child exploitation, child sacrifice, sex with children. What is this fascination with this? Okay. We are all sinners. I get it, but I have I don't get the fascination with this. It's just simply demonic, okay. And so what Germany has done is lowered the the uh, uh, penalties for the possession of child porn. I think at one time it was one year minimum sentence. They've lowered it. I think the minimum to three months. Three months for possession of a certain child porn, and it's now a misdemeanor. Why are you lowering the penalty? So they're not just going to dispense with it and say it's legal to have it. They're always going to push the envelope. They push it two steps forward. Somebody pushes back. OK, they back up a step and then they wait a while. Then it's two steps forward. And I have told people all along with this progressivism, this is where we would end up. And it's going to get more horrific as we go forward. It's not going to get better. In order to fix this again, it's so outside the realm of people's thinking that they don't even want to contemplate it. I don't even want to discuss it, okay? It is going to require the pendulum swinging so far back to the other side and uh, bloodying some noses is, is an understatement of what's going to have to happen, okay? And so it is what it is. You need to, you're warned about this. These people are going to keep pushing, pushing, pushing with this stuff forever until they get their way, okay? And you were warned about it. Um, you could say it will never happen here, but this is where we're going, okay? Um, I do know, like, just in my studies with some people uh, that I've been doing, the people that are going to become uh, priests in the Orthodox Church, you know, some of, some of the what they've been told, you know, you have to prepare yourself for what's going to happen. And this is, you know, this is getting into spirituality. A lot of people don't want to consider this, but I do. Okay. There's, there's an evil here. Okay. That is indescribable to me and people, you know, people don't pick up on it. They don't think that there's evil in the world or they dismiss it, or they don't think that it's personalized in, uh, in into a personalization. Okay. And it is. Okay. And, uh, you know, I believe in a final victory of God and Christ. I think that that's obvious. But in the meantime, this is what's happening. This is why I think yeah, we have to push back on the media. We have to disassociate ourselves. I'm not saying, again, to become a monk, a monastic, and, you know, live a life of total denial. 
but the secular world is sick and getting sicker. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've predicted this is going to happen. This is going to get worse in my view. Again, it's always going to be two steps forward, one step back. And so you can consider this any way you want. Maybe this isn't appropriate for this channel, but again, I, I think this is go you're going to see more, more and more of this, this constant attacks on children. What kind of societies, sick societies, allow attacks on their women and children? These are societies that don't exist, shouldn't exist any longer. The primary role of government is to protect the weak and defenseless, not allow ex further exploitation or lower the punishments for exploiting them. I mean, for heaven's sakes. But that's my opinion, and I'll leave it there. Uh, that's it for this week, guys. I appreciate the support. Again, I've explained all the ways you can support the channel. I appreciate your support. We're running a business here, so help us out if you can. Just liking and subscribing helps. Uh, I'm sure the comments will be lively this week. Let's keep it, uh, you know, uh, above board. Uh, again, I don't even like talking about this stuff, but I, I, I think that this does exist in the world and people need to face reality. All right, guys, that's it for this week. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.